A special police unit in the UK using some sophisticated tools to monitor social networks, including facial recognition software and geolocation. For more on the thin boundaries between security and privacy, let's go live to Dia Chakravarti, Deputy Director of the Freedom Association. Thanks for joining us here on RT. So everything that's posted in social networks or most everything that's post posted in social networks is generally open to a lot of people, especially on Twitter, for example. So why are people so concerned over privacy with this if it's generally out there anyway? Well, you're right in making a differentiation, a distinction between the sort of data we were talking about when the when the prison controversy broke and the sort of data we're talking about now, which, as you rightly say, people choose to put out there on a public platform, um, on social networking websites, for example. Uh, but just think about it this way. Some of it is actually quite quite personal the information. It could be information like what film you're watching, who you're watching it with, who you're having dinner with, where you're spending the night, that sort of information. Now. Just consider the situation. If you had a man in a trench coat and a silly hat following you around, noting those bits of information about you, he would also be gathering it from the public, uh, 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 from the public arena, from uh, everything that's out in the public. But I'm sure you'd still feel like your privacy was being invaded. And this is nothing different, really. It's just being done digitally. Now, activists are complaining over the legislative oversight, but how can monitoring of social networks be controlled or legislated? And that's an interesting question, because if you think about my previous example of the man in the trench coat, he would probably have uh, parliamentary oversight in carrying out his, his physical spying on people. There would be parliamentary framework within which he'd have to act. We're not sure that any such parliamentary oversight is in existence when it comes to internet surveillance. And with the right will and help from the experts, it can be done. Internet surveillance can be uh, more targeted, for example. Um, the, the risk of putting people by gathering so much data about every single person uh, can be minimized if this could be done uh, in a more targeted way. Do you think if there were more information out there uh, from the government, people would understand that this is do being done for their own protection, for their own good, for public safety? Well, I mean, you know, it would be naive to say that there's no need for surve surveillance. I don't think anybody's saying that at all. Our concern, as you brought up rightly, is with the parliamentary oversight of how that information is gleaned and how that information is stored. The second concern is with the sheer scope of, the, of, this, of this surveillance, the sheer amount of data that is being gathered on the sheer number of people. Um, and if you talk about risks and the government protecting us from those risks, then let's talk about the risks that um, the government puts us in by gleaming, gleaning this much information about us. So there are two specific risks that I can think of. First of all is, um, is false positives. So when you gather so much information, uh, the, error of ma uh, the margin of error, excuse me, the margin of error is also considerable. And if you, were, if you were to take a more narrow and targeted approach, you could diminish that risk. The second risk, and it's a very important risk, is the loss of data, the risk of inadvertent loss or theft of data. And we've seen a fair few examples of this over the last few uh, weeks, years, to make it a very serious concern indeed. Who's protecting us from those? All right, Dia Chakravarti, Deputy Director of the Freedom Association, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me.